I can't tell you the last time I was on a bus in Halifax, and I certainly am uh, grateful for being able to work from home. My name is Sheldon McLeod. This is Thinking Out Loud, and um, my opportunity here on the Saltwater Network to talk about stories that are important. Here's an important story. About a month ago, Halifax had changed up uh, several of its routes to deal with a shortage in, of drivers. And Andrew Rankin wrote a rather extensive story about this, quoting some of the folks involved with the local of the Amalgamated Transit Union. Uh, and I saw this as well. And uh, well, maybe this is speaking more to uh, the frustration levels. Uh, this is from the Twitter account of ATU uh, Local 508. For two years, people are quitting faster than they can be hired. If this was your business, you'd investig investigate management. Uh, they wouldn't admit they screwed up. You gave management a huge raise and they're destroying transit. Those are pretty strong words. And that is something I wanted to follow up with uh, with Shane O'Leary. He's the president of the, the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 508. Uh, Shane, it's nice to see you again. Thank you for doing this. You too, Sheldon. Thank you very much for having me. And, and I'm not saying that's your Twitter account, but someone with the union had posted a, a bit of frustration. Tell me what's going on. Uh, well, it, it's not my personal Twitter account. I have one of those, but I authorize everything that's on that Twitter account. So, um, yes, I can be blamed for it. All right. Blame or credit. Tell me um, what message. It sounds pretty blunt. What message you're trying to get out? Who are you speaking to in that tweet? Uh, we continually tweet out messages so that the public understands the frustration that we're dealing with. We're almost two years without a contract. Um, yeah, Halifax Council issues themselves raises. Um, our managers get raises. Uh, one of them in particular, I think she got an 11% raise. Dave Rigi, if you go back through the, uh, who's the executive director of transit, if you go back yeah. through the sunshine list, and I mean, this is common knowledge, so I'm not, uh, I, I'm not attacking him in any way, mm -hmm. but between 2016 and 2021, his wages went up by 63%, I think. Um, we've been almost two years of our contract for our own members. So we're basically two years behind in wage scales. We're the lowest paid in the Atlantic region. We're one of the lowest paid in the country overall, and not just operators, um, but mechanics. Uh, there's, there's great job openings right now for mechanics and other transit industries that are paid way above our wages and you don't have to work back shift and night shift. Ferry workers are, are paid below the averages across the country. Um, it, it, the city is just not keeping up. There should be a lineup at the door and there's not. This is a good municipal job. And growing up, I always thought I would even be a garbage man for the city, which they've contracted out because it had a pension and it had benefits and it was a good municipal job. There's, I'm sorry, no go worries. ahead. No worries. I, I just want to talk a minute for, I had mentioned to you seeing an ad for well transit operators in St. John and Brunswick where they said starting wages just over $30. They provide all the training. Uh, how does that compare to what's happening in Halifax Transit? Starting wage at Halifax in Halifax is twenty one fifty five for training, and then it goes up to twenty two eighty eight, and it's a four year wage step to get three dollars less an hour than their starting wage in New Brunswick. So now, we're, walk, we're we're way behind. Walk me through what uh, has been happening from your perspective as someone who's seeing uh, an aggressive campaign to, to recruit. We, we, I'm seeing the ads. I'm seeing Halifax is trying to get people's attention to try and get them to sign up, to, to sign on. But you're saying they're not staying. What, what's going on there? I think we've had 22 operator resignations so far this year. So far this year, since January 1st. That says a lot. Um, if you're bringing people in and training them and spending the amount of money training them, there should be some incentive to stay. And if it takes you four years to get to top rate as a conventional operator or an accessible bus operator uh, who are paid even less than conventional operators, then there's no real incentive. When they removed Protection of Property Act uh, because the Crown decided to reinterpret it after 20 some years, We've lost a protection out there for our members. Our members are getting assaulted and attacked, the same as every uh, transit system in North America. The, the transit operators are a target out there, 
and they just decided to take away protection for us. So uh, it, it, it's not only underpaid and overworked, but it's unsafe. What does tell, talk me through that? What does that mean that they've reinterpreted this uh, from the crown level? What, what exactly are you referring to? Well, the Protection of Property Act it can be enacted to remove somebody from a premises um, for up to six months if they've done something that violates policies and um, you know it, it's usually used in a, in a case for assault. So if you get on a bus and assault somebody or attack somebody, including the operator, uh, you get removed from the bus, and the supervisors can uh, PPA you Protection of Property Act for up to six months. Um, for some reason, the city has decided they're not going to do that anymore. So operators of buses and workers on the ferries no longer have protections in place. So you could assault an operator and then just get on another bus and the city won't do anything about it. We're in an unsafe situation out there when assaults are at an all time high. Um, I need to ask you another question because I saw someone talk about uh, if a driver gets up out of their seat, that's considered an aggressive act. And that does also complicate trying to protect yourself. Is that that accurate? So we're in our workspace as, as operators, we're in a very confined small area in the front of the bus. And we have a sneeze guard for a shield that um, is very flimsy and hopefully will be replaced soon. Uh, but if you get on my bus and attack me in any way, shape, or form, and I get out of my seat to defend myself, the employer decides that uh, as soon as I get out of my seat, I have become the aggressor. So we're sitting ducks in our seats. We're either uh, looking at discipline or we're looking at getting assaulted. And with the removal of the, the Protection of Property Act, we're even in more danger. And the city has promised us a bylaw and... I, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit. A month and a half ago, we went into the Transportation Standing Committee, uh, myself and one of my my table officers. Uh, we we went into the Transportation Standing Committee, and we explained how we had lost protection out there. It was now the city producing an unsafe workplace for us, and they told us to do up a presentation. So we did up a presentation, and then they decided that they weren't going to let us speak. And they weren't going to let us put up our presentation. And they did everything to block us up to and including canceling the meeting. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to hear from us. We went into council and I literally almost got thrown out of council because I was challenged by one of the um, counselors. And I'm not going to use his name on here, but he literally openly challenged me after a decision was made to spend $400,000 on four new supervisors who have no power and no authority. So they're spending an extra $400,000 to hire four new supervisors that are only permitted to write tickets in bus stops. Hmm. So they're not going to be able to protect us because we don't have a transit police system. We don't have any enforcement out here. And now we don't have any protection. There was a time Halifax uh, police were being encouraged to ride the bus in fact, for just that reason, for protection of not just the driver or the operator, but the passengers as well. I suspect, I suspect that hasn't happened. We have one police officer that is assigned to, to monitor transit, and he goes from transit terminal to transit terminal. And the reason being is um, there's an extensive amount of uh, youth and young adults hanging out at these terminals as hangouts and it's jeopardizing the safety of passengers and uh, transit workers. And it sounds like uh, they're closing some of those just to, for that reason, to keep crowds from gathering and causing trouble. They are. And explain to me how efficient that is for the transit system, because I don't understand it. Let's go back in time. Uh, you say two years since a contract. It's been uh, about two and a half, three years since Halifax has tried to move things more quickly, changing, uh, putting bus lanes, advanced turn. There, it sounds like they're doing a lot to help transit move through the city more efficiently. But it seems the catching point here is having enough people to actually operate these buses. That, that, that's a good point. Uh, transit lanes are efficient. Rapid bus transit is efficient. 
transit is only going to be efficient if you have people in the seat to drive the buses or operate the ferries or repair the buses uh, or clean them. And if those, if the foundation of the system is not strong enough, mm -hmm. then, then there's no reason. I mean, there's close to a hundred managers and less than a thousand uh, union members. And the system is not running efficiently. So things have to change at the top. There's, there's something seriously wrong with the management system running transit because it's not running efficiently. Um, and, and if you can't retain staff in, in the largest municipality in the Atlantic provinces, east of Montreal, you have the fastest growing problem, one of the fastest growing provinces in the country, one of the fastest growing municipalities in the city, and you're losing employees. So there's something wrong. And I always say, if you want to attract employees, you got to pay them properly. If you want to keep them, you have to treat them properly. And neither of those things are happening right now. I would offer to you that in, in a situation where there's limited supply of uh, workers, that puts more power in the hands of the labor force. Uh, traditionally, that would be, you know, it's supply and demand. And if there are, uh, there's a greater supply than a, there, or, or a greater demand than there is supply, that's obviously going to come out in the wash. So why is it that Halifax hasn't increased the rate? Is it, I'm sure you're having the conversations two years without a contract it's clear that the wages and working conditions would have to be on the table we we are um in negotiations right now we have sat a few times and talked uh we have not discussed money yet uh that is up to council to come back to us at this point in time uh we did we advised um the city and transit that we were ready to negotiate over two years ago, two years ago, because our contract expired August 31st of 2021. We advised them and we are still not finished. So by the time we actually get a contract and get it brought to our members and voted on and ratified, we're looking at two years. That's too long. They they knew these problems were going to happen with COVID two years ago, yet they made no attempt to try to rectify the situation. Uh, the, the, the city is failing transit. The city is failing the ridership. And is this, are you hearing from other municipalities across the country? Is this happening elsewhere with this labor issue? Um. The, the, there's a labor issue right across the country. Uh, I read an article a week or two ago. I don't. I, I can't remember who wrote it, but basically they said the only way to fix transit is to increase the wages to a uh, Sheldon twenty one fifty five to start and twenty two eighty eight for a year. That's below living wages in Halifax. That isn't, and that's outside of inflation. That's outside of of the cost of living. That's outside of. Uh, the increases in, in food and the, we have members that are ready to go to food banks. We have members that, that can't afford rent in one bedroom apartments. We're city municipal workers. We, like, this city has what, how many cranes in the city? This city just increased property tax by 4% right across the board. This city has money. This city should be treating its workers better than it is. I know the federal government in past budget years have offered some support uh, to transit, trying to green the system, trying to encourage more people to use mass transit. The budget's about to be released later today. I know I don't know what's in it. I'm pretty sure you're not, uh, you weren't one of the people they leaked the information to. So any hope, anything you'd like to say or suggest about what supports might be needed, either provincially or federally? Um, we do need more support, but the problem with, um, federal funding, uh, Sheldon, is that there's no dedicated funding. And what dedicated funding is, is when the government says, here's $20 million, use $3 million of it for salary, use $2 million of it for new buses, use $5 million of it for road improvements, use $6 million of it for, and my math is probably wrong, but um, it, it's not dedicated funding. So they would give the city a lump sum of money and the city can do whatever it wants with it. 
And in the past, the city has gone outside of Halifax Transit and funded these little community private van usages. And those little companies are profiting off the backs of the money that should be invested in the municipal transit system for everybody, not just little organizations outside the city. Transit is a service that should be provided for everybody in this municipality. And it's not. They cut service because they said they had to uh, alleviate the overworking of the, the, the staff. But by doing that, they've cut back on what passengers deserve, what the ridership deserves. And if you look at the base of it, they should have been able to attract employees, train them and keep them rather than cutting service. It needs to be fast. It needs to be fast. All the complaining I did about our members being overworked, they didn't alleviate it by hiring staffing properly. They They alleviated it by cutting service to the people who deserve the service. Right. And it needs to be fast, efficient, and affordable. And it sounds like if one of those three legs is missing, it's not going to succeed. What is your message? How do you get this out to councillors? I mean, we've got a obviously a municipal election in, in a year and a half, but how does Shane O'Leary move the needle on this after two years of seemingly banging his head against the wall? We have asked council to come speak with us. They have refused to do so. We have... Um, I almost got thrown out of the budget meeting last week or two weeks ago because council does not want to hear what we have to say. Council does not want to hear what we have to say. And they use the party line, well, you're in negotiations. So my safety doesn't matter because I'm in negotiations. My members don't matter because I'm in negotiations. Council refuses to speak to us. Council does not want to meet up with us. And once in a while, one of them will say, oh, no, no, we care, we care, but they don't. And I know there's two counselors out there that are running food banks. And you know what? That's a fantastic thing. But why are we living in a city that people need to go to food banks? Uh, the, and, and I'll go back to the thing where counselors are giving themselves raises, but they're not working with the people that work for them. Um, to get the message out there, we tried, and we the only people that listen to us are people like you, Shelton, um, and, and that's about the only way we get the message out there because they don't want to hear us. Council does not want to hear us. The mayor doesn't want to hear us. Uh, the executive director doesn't want to hear us. If Dave Regie walked through the lobby of a transit building, 99% of the people wouldn't know who he is. He doesn't even work out of transit. He works out of downtown. Well, it does sound like uh, frustration is, uh, well, it's clear that this has been frustrating for you for some time. And uh, I know that uh, the riders are going to feel that too, uh, either through reduced numbers of runs or, or routes or, or schedule changes. Uh, we'll leave it at that, Shane O'Leary. Uh, with some luck, perhaps uh, we'll get a little bit closer to a meeting, a sit down and a, a contract for the members so that we can have a, a system that works for everyone. I'm talking the passengers as well as the people who or uh, driving the bus. I hope so, Sheldon. There's not a successful city in the world that doesn't have a successful transit system. And our transit system is not successful. We got uh, 205 cruise ships coming in this year and the Indigenous Games, North American Indigenous Games, with 5,000 volunteer, 5,000 athletes and 3,000 volunteers. And we don't have a transit system that's working efficiently. Something we, need, we, we deserve better. We deserve better. President of Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 508, uh, Shane O'Leary. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sheldon. Have a wonderful day.